Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute and part of the Christians for Liberty Network. I'm your host, Doug Stewart, and I have, man, I tell you what, this has been such a long time coming to have this interview because I've been wanting to talk to Kelly Wiener-Smith on her new book with her husband. Kelly is part of the wife and husband research team who co-wrote the New York Times bestselling popular science book, Soon-ish. Kelly is also an adjunct faculty member in the Biosciences Department at Rice University. She's here to discuss with us her book, A City on Mars, Can We Settle Space? Should We Settle Space? And Have We Really Thought This Through? Hey, Kelly, thanks for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I ordered your book, like the day that you posted on Facebook that it was available for pre-order. And it turns out that I could have made a trip to Mars in the amount of time I had to wait for your book. (laughs) It did take a long time. It's frustrating how long it is between pre-order and and get into the shelves. Yeah, well, and especially, I don't know if I had heard that you guys were writing the book before you wrote on Facebook. I guess you were publishing, like, hey, we sent it off to the publisher and all that kind of stuff. Maybe it was like, I even waited longer and I was waiting for the pre-order and then waiting for the book to arrive and, and all of that. It's a fantastic book in a number of ways. It's disappointing, but not because of the book, but because you sort of shatter expectations of what it's gonna be like to possibly settle in space. But it's a very realistic book on the one hand. By the time I finished it, I realized that you might have missed an opportunity to call your book later-ish, you know, to sort of (laughs) counterbalance soon-ish, because it's like, wow, this is really far off. (laughs) Like, we're not ready. (laughs) Yeah, and that's not the book we thought we were going to write. Like, we thought that after writing soon-ish, we thought space settlements were, you know, maybe going to come around pretty soon, because soon-ish was talking about some technologies that we thought would facilitate settlements. And so it was a four-year process, and only about halfway through, we realized we're not writing the book about space settlements coming in a decade or two. We're writing the book about how space settlements are probably not going to be here in our lifetime. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of a bummer, but we tried to keep it light. Yeah. Well, you actually went in before doing all the really like nerdy research and attending conferences and so forth, thinking that maybe we were within the decade. Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Well, tell us about the research approach that you took. I mean, this, in my mind, you're probably not just reading Kim Stanley Robinson and, you know, all the books that are sort of sci-fi and give a rosy picture of what it looks like, you know, just keep watching The Martian on TV and being like, look, I can see it done. Ridley Scott showed me how it can be done. What was the research approach like? Yeah, so, I mean, we are sci-fi nerds. And so part of why we were excited about space settlements in the first place was because we've read about them in sci-fi and we just would love to see them be a reality. And so we started with space medicine. And so we bought a bunch of space medicine textbooks. There are people who are, you know, experts in space medicine And when we were reading through, we were like, oh, man, there's a bunch of stuff that we don't have enough data on. And that was kind of surprising. And then we bought this guy, Badescu, does this huge series. Each book is like a thousand pages on like resources on Mars and resources in the asteroid belt. And how do you get them? And we realized like, oh, my gosh, there's no carbon on the moon and we're carbon based life forms. Like there's all this stuff you'd have to bring to the moon to make it habitable and sort of each chapter, we had a bunch of textbooks and a bunch of scientific papers. And then we talked to experts. And at the moment we have, I think it's either 23 or 27, like rows on our bookshelves filled with space books, plus a bunch of PDFs <laughs> on our computers yeah, yeah, and a bunch of time at conferences. And, you know, we thought we were going to get this book done much faster, but it took us two years or sorry, four years with both of us reading, you know, for a couple hours every day and taking notes to feel like we really understood what was going on. And so, you know, and then we got into space law and there were space law textbooks and that was complicated. And so it was a lot of reading and then yeah. a lot a lot of going on walks and talking about like, oh, I learned this and you learned that and, you know, what should go in the book. Yeah. And, yeah. So did you have to go on walks because your kids told you, please stop talking about this at the <laughs> they- dinner table? <laughs> Our daughter is really tired of hearing about space law. Like we we offered when when they were doing the solar system thing, we're like, oh, we'll come in and we'll tell them about Mars. And then we can also talk a little bit about how space is governed. And she said, please governed. don't come. To, yeah. Yeah. She's like, please don't come to my classroom. And I was like, all right, you've right, we've put you through enough. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's pretty funny. So the approach that you took, I mean, your acknowledgments, you sort of you had to dance around the fact that you might have made enemies based on mm-hmm. your like not quite optimistic approach, which is kind of funny because you'd think people who are 
really gung-ho about making it to space. Not necessarily the Elon Musks and Jeff Bezos's of the world, but just the, the space nerds like, oh, is it Robert Zubrin? Like those types of like the case for Mars type people would want to hear, hey, yo, slow your roll. We don't know this yet. We don't know that yet. We don't know this yet. I mean, I'm guessing you had conversations with some of these people, or did you? And what was some of the reaction you had when you guys were like, yeah, not so soon? When we met a bunch of these people, it was kind of early in the process. And that was back when we thought we were writing a This Is Happening Soon book. Mm, okay. And then, you know, for Zubrin, for example, we, we read all of his books. Some of them, you know, we read twice to make sure we really absorbed all of them. Zubrin recently referred to us as the enemy. And so he's not happy with our book. There's been a lot of people in the community who That's I crazy. do think. I know. I know there's, but there's a lot of people in the community who are like, oh, this is great. This is like all in one spot, a summary of the different interdisciplinary approaches we need to take to make this happen. And like, this is our roadmap, let's go. And they're excited. But then there are other people who are like, you know, you're slowing down the dream and they're not so happy with us. Well, I mean, on the one hand, to me, I have, I mean, I don't have a personal stake in whether we can make it to Mars. Like I'm not invested the way Elon Musk is or something like that, or even Robert Zubrin who wants to see this happen. I would love to see it happen in the same way that you approach this. But I had the same, like both sides reaction I had, right? Like, it was sort of like, oh, this is disappointing. And I could mm-hmm. see why someone would call you the enemy, but not like in a serious way, but more as in like, oh, yeah, you're, you know, you're slowing us down. We don't like that. But hey, it's still helpful. It, it That's kind of surprising to me that people wouldn't at least see it as, as somewhat helpful. And I'm sure there, obviously it has. So it's kind of controversial in that sense. But in, in the other, it's like, it's very realistic. Like, I didn't realize that the moon would be technically, you know, once we're there, harder to settle than Mars. There's so much, you use the word interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach that I thought brought the real value because I learned more than just like rocket science stuff, which is really doesn't feature heavily in the book because we're kind of figuring that piece out. It's what do we do when we get there kind of thing. And so you talk about economics, science, history, international law. And, you know, One thing we probably should note that there's plenty of puns and sarcasm in this book and (laughs) illustrations. Yeah. So that was the way to keep it light and also just like fun. I mean, the quote on on the front is Andy Weir says it's fun as hell. (laughs) So (laughs) it's very, it's very good. I like that it was it had a realistic vision of things. So let's talk a little bit about what are some of the um well, why do people want to go to space? There's kind of two dominant reasons that you tend to cover. What are those? Well, so I, you know, I'd argue that maybe there's more than two and it depends a lot on what community you're talking to. And so the folks who are excited about rotating space stations, a lot of their arguments are uh, centered around this idea that if we want to save the Earth, we should be bringing people and industry out to space. And that way we'll Mm -hmm. lessen the planet or lessen the, you know, our effect on this planet. I don't really feel like that holds water, especially when you start thinking about the number of people you'd need to move to space. The math doesn't really quite... Yeah. 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 Like I right now you'd have to move something like 220,000 people per day just <laughs> to keep population stable, right? And right yeah, now right. the propellants we use in our rockets are not very environmentally friendly, so launching all that pe- those many people to space is probably not going to help climate change a lot. And also we have nowhere to put them. And we you know, we don't know how to keep them alive yet. And so not I don't think this is going to be a near-term solution for climate change. Yeah. Yeah. And then the the Musks of the world are excited about space as a plan B. So if, you know, Earth gets hit by an asteroid or becomes uninhabitable because of nuclear war or whatever, if you have a backup of humanity on Mars, then you, have you know, sort of made it more likely that our species will persist. And I like humans. I'd like to see us persist no matter sure. what happens on the Earth. But as we try to argue in the book, it's going to be a really long time before a bunch of people on Mars would be able to survive the death of Earth. Mm-hmm. So if something bad happens to Earth, the Martians are dead, but maybe there's just going to be a time lag because for a very long time, they're going to need supplies from Earth to keep themselves going because it's going to be really hard to, you know, create a life on Mars that's self-sustaining. So I think, you know, Bezos and Musk are probably the two most often heard advocates for space, and those are their two most popular arguments. Yeah. Okay. So when you went into this being somewhat optimistic, what was your sort of favorite reason for settling space? It's awesome. 
Like I, I we kind of where I was too, right? Yeah, we. You know, I, I don't think even going into it, I don't think we bought. You know, you hear other people say like you go to space and you, you know, you don't see borders anymore, and all of our politicians will get along if they everybody could see Earth <laughs> from above. And there's all, you know, there's all these arguments where we you were can like, get in ah. an airplane and not see borders too. That's right. And you're and people, you know, I've seen people sitting in the window seat slap somebody in front for putting their seat back. So, like, you know, apparently not seeing borders doesn't make us all nicer. And like, I let's see that person wasn't looking out the window to be inspired by not seeing borders. So that's right. If you had just tapped him on the shoulder and said, look out the window, they all would have calmed down. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I don't buy that argument. And, you know, at the end of the day, I just I think it's awesome. And I think that to some extent, that's a good enough argument to say, like, it's awesome. Nobody has a right to stop me. And, you know, we make this comparison to a hot tub in the book. So, like, hot tubs are awesome. Nobody has a right to tell me I can't get a hot tub. And that's good enough. I want it. And it's just a thing that I have a right to have. But, you know, the argument is a little different if you're talking about something like a nuclear weapon. So if I wanted a nuclear weapon so that I could, I don't know, feel safer at night, I still don't have a right to get it because I could it could hurt somebody else, me acquiring that. And so I guess we were trying to figure out is space more like a hot tub or a nuclear weapon. And unfortunately, we end up, ended up determining that, you know, through the process of starting a space settlement, you could, for example, kick off a new space race between, you know, China and the United States, mm-hmm. which might, you know, geopolitically be quite bad as we're both nuclear wielding powers. Uh, and so, you know, it's not just something that's awesome and has no risk to anyone else. It's something that has implications for the rest of the Earth once you get this project started. So people have a right to sort of weigh in. Yeah, yeah. What are some of the bad reasons that you found out there? You sort of categorize, I think, roughly eight of them. And some of them are the silly, like, we look down on Earth and see no borders type stuff. And I'm just like, that's so idealistic. How cute. But like, but what are some of the wrong. others? It, yeah, it's, right. It's, a, it's also not so I, we, I got to do one interview with a Russian cosmonaut. And I asked him, like, can you see borders? And he goes, oh, yeah, you can definitely see. I think it was... Pakistan and India, and you can see North Korea and South Korea because North yeah. Korea is completely dark. Well, Haiti, Dominican Republic would be another example. Yeah. Yeah, 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 right. So that nice sounding thing isn't even true. And so, okay, so let's see. So there's the, we're all going to be wise like philosophers. We'll get along. <laughs> Space is going to stop war is another popular one. And so the ideas there are that there'll be so much territory in space that we are not going to need to fight about land on Earth anymore because there's just going to be more than enough to go around. And, you know, we talk to war scholars and they're like, no, that's like, that's not how it works. Like, it's not about (laughs) square footage, you know, like you can't say, hey, Russia and Ukraine, stop fighting over Crimea. We'll each give you the same landmass in Antarctica. Yeah, right. And chill out. And so, you know, literally. Right. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So it's usually about specific pieces of land, not like, hectares in general. And then another argument is that, you know, the resources, uh, another reason humans go to war is over resources. And if we get resources from space, then we'll all stop fighting. And again, we talked to a bunch of scholars who study causes of war and they were like, no, there's not actually great evidence that we go to war over resources. That sort of like becomes part of what's important once a war starts, but that's not usually the thing that wars start over. That's actually an interesting side point there is that a lot of the stuff that you discuss in your book actually has like whether or not there's a question of space. I mean, this is sort of the proxy for understanding science in a different way in history and international law and things like that. It's like, oh, well, I didn't know that, that resources weren't quite the primary only thing we go after. And this is not how war works. So you actually get a sense in your book of you can learn things that are really not necessarily about space. Obviously, you're using that as a mechanism for getting there. And I think that was a really valuable piece of it. So yeah, some of those things are just like, "Eh, okay, yeah, great. Earlier, you said that we really don't know a lot. There's not been a lot of space medicine research there. It's like there's just a lot of open-ended questions or inconclusive research. How have humans gone about so far learning what they can in, in the science realm about what it's like in space for humans and, and I guess other mammals. This is a topic going in where when we started writing, we thought we almost certainly probably knew all the space settlement, you know, <laughs> medicine we needed because, you know, humans have been in orbiting space stations. Yeah, for a you while. Know, from, yeah, more than 50 years, I think, if you start with the Solutes. And so, you know, surely we've been collecting the right kind of data, but, you know, none of those space stations were fielded specifically with the goal of preparing us for space settlement. 
And so we've collected a lot of biological data on the astronauts and on, you know, quails and mice and rodents that we yeah. sent up there, but it's not applicable to life in a space settlement. And that's for a couple of reasons. So one, these space stations are essentially in free fall around the Earth. So you're experiencing zero gravity. And in zero gravity, your bones start breaking down. Like I think you lose 1% of the bone mass in your hips every month that you're in space. And then, you know, your fluids shift up and you get extra pressure in your head. And we think that that's why astronauts return with poorer vision than when they went up there. Muscle mass goes down. So we know that there's all of these problems with essentially no gravity. But Mars is 40% gravity. And Mars is probably our best shot at a self-sustaining settlement. And so we don't know, is like 40% gravity going to make all those problems go away completely? Or is it just going to diminish them? You yeah. know? So for example, instead of losing a month or 1% per month of the you know bone mineral density in your hips, if you only lose 0.1% per month, you know, that sounds better. But if instead of, you know, just like a year or something, whereas that's a very long stay for an astronaut, if you're growing up in this environment, that 0.1% per month could really add up. And maybe hips are just not going to be able to handle childbirth if they're that weak by the time you're, you know, an adult. And so, so there's a lot we don't know about how partial gravity is going to impact bodies. And then also our space stations are within the magnetosphere. So all of the radiation that space has to offer is not hitting those astronauts. So we don't have a very good sense of how radiation impacts bodies. Mm -hmm. And again, astronauts, like the longest day has been 437 days by a Russian cosmonaut. And that's the longest we've been up there. And so, you know, we're not being exposed to the right kinds of radiation. We're not up there for very long. So at the end of the day, we don't know much about radiation or, my, or partial gravity, which could be two major problems yeah. if you're trying to grow up in space. Well, and that cosmonaut probably wasn't one capable of giving birth. That's right. Yeah, no, it was most of the cosmonauts who have ever gone up have been men. And I think it was Polyakov. It was a dude. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's just a lot more to go. I mean, your book is filled with, we suspect it's this reason, but we don't know. <laughs> yeah. For that. What about beyond the science? What about psychology, sociology, those kind of factors? Because, you know, we've done some research on, you know, habitats in Antarctica or the middle of nowhere desert places. Yeah, so the psychology problems are interesting. So we spent a lot of time reading about polar expeditions, life in Arctic research stations, life on Navy submarines, to just sort of get a sense of what psychology is like when you're in an isolated and confined environment where you're sort of separated from the rest of your loved ones. And, you know, it's kind of a scary place to be because you, you might die. And, you know, it looks like if you have good selection, so you're careful about who you invite into that environment, then psychological problems aren't that wor that much worse than you'd see in like the general public. So people seem to do pretty well in these kind of environments, but you're still going to need to plan for the kind of problems that just sort of pop up in all of us from time to time. So you're going to need some psychological care, and that's going to be tough on Mars because for, you know, some people use medication to deal with anxiety or depression, and we don't know if those things are going to be shelf-stable in response to space radiation on the six-month journey to Mars, and then how long they'll last once they get there. And then additionally, if you're on Mars, the fastest communication between Earth and Mars is a three-minute delay. And it can be as long as 22 minutes because we're just so far away, it takes the message a long time to, to transmit. And so you're not going to be able to have real-time calls with psychiatrists and psychologists back home. So you're going to want to send some people. Uh, and so there's just a very real risk that somebody might have a mental breakdown in space and you won't be able to help them. And they're going to be, you know, far away from any of the resources and in this enclosed habitat that they really can't get out of. So that's a little bit scary. And then you've got interpersonal things to worry about. So I think my favorite example of this comes from Biosphere 2, which was this giant 3.14 acre enclosed facility in Arizona where they were trying to make an ecosystem that, you know, generated all of the food, all of the oxygen that they needed and was completely self-sustaining. And there were eight people in it for two years. And... About a year in, they split into factions and they hated each other so much they were literally spitting on each other. And they were stuck <laughs> with each other for another year. And so, you know, you've got to be careful when people have no other options. You've got to think through, like, what kind of psychological support can you offer for these people? And it gets complicated. Yeah. Well, and you also know that on Earth, while you might be in somewhat of an endangered environment with space, there's, <laughs> there's no, like daily flights out. Maybe the moon could happen there, but 
not with Mars. You know, you got to wait at least six months, if not longer, depending. And so you can't just use an escape hatch the way you could technically, if you felt endangered, I guess, in these, in like biosphere, I'm sure there was sort of emergency protocols for that kind of thing. Yeah. So you always had that in the back of your mind, whereas the other option is death. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons that the moon, to me, is such a great staging ground for moving out to the rest of space. So you can, you know, figure out what kind of supports do we need for people? How do we get these re- these systems that recycle our water and our breathing gases? How do we get them working reliably at a location that's always the same distance away from Earth and is about a three-day journey home? So if something goes wrong, you can get those people there really quick. You yeah, know, if it turns yeah. out that five years on the moon results in bones that are just a mess and we can't survive in partial gravity, you can, you know, send those people home and, you know, give them medicine on the trip home or something like that. But Mars, like you said, so it's a six-month trip out. You have to stay there for about a year. And after about a year, because of orbital mechanics, Mars is sort of moving, so it'll be close to Earth again, and you can start the six-month journey back. So if something goes wrong on your journey, you you are very far away from help from Earth. You're mm-hmm. probably not going to be able to get the help you need. Amazingly, it worked out in The Martian by Andy <laughs> Weir. Uh, but it would most most of the time, if there was a problem on Mars, you would be dead. Yeah, I think our vision of what it would be like. So there's like, I don't know if you watched the show For All Mankind on Apple TV. I watched a couple episodes. Yeah, so they're like, they're in the third season, they make it to Mars and they're, you know, it's like, what is it like here? And, you know, we have this vision of like these little pop-up habitats. Like the way the restaurants made COVID outdoor, indoor slash COVID things during 2020, it's like, hey, we need to put these people in these little bubbles. And we envision those types of things when it comes to Mars. But, you know, the cover of your book actually shows all underground. Mm -hmm. It's like, really? And it's going to go up there and live underground? Because you kind of lead us to that, you know, maybe describe why it is that we can't really be on the surface. And yeah. Sure. So radiation, as I mentioned, we don't understand the risks very well. But what we do know is that Mars does not have a magnetosphere like Earth. We're also protected on the surface of Earth by our thick atmosphere that sort of catches some radiation on the way down. But Mars's atmosphere is only 1% of Earth. So if you walk outside, you will die. You, that's not enough to sustain people. It's also mostly made of carbon dioxide. But most of that radiation that hits Mars is going to come down to the surface and could hit you as well. And so most of the proposals that we saw involved taking the dirt off of the Martian surface, which is nasty stuff. We can talk about that too. Taking the dirt off the Martian surface and essentially packing it around your habitat or digging down underneath it so that the dirt can essentially absorb the radiation and not get to the people inside. So we're going to be, you know, sort of like ants living on Mars. But that dirt also helps with temperature swings. It sort of dampens the temperature swings. And because Mm -hmm. Mars has such a thin atmosphere, the like, you know, little rocks from space that come in, they don't get burned up the way they do in Earth's atmosphere. So that layer of dirt will also help you, you know, sort of absorb the impacts from some of those smaller pieces. Uh Um, So, yeah, it's quite likely, you know, most of the time when you see visions of living in space, you're in these beautiful glass domes with amazing views up into the stars. Uh, That's probably not what it's going to look like. If you had that, you would be baked by the radiation and the temperature swing. So we'll probably be living under dirt. Yeah. Okay. so it's not like living in Arizona, but just with no atmosphere. So it's not like, okay, this is beautiful. So, yeah, let's talk about the dirt because I think people have this impression that it just looks like, you know, again, like The Martian is very often, you know, what many people have in their minds or maybe some other movie or whatever. It's just a red planet. So we see some of these pictures that come from NASA and we think, oh, well, that's just rocky. And it's like, you know, living in the desert. Why <laughs> why will Mars kill us more so than just the atmosphere? So that, that dirt is called uh, regolith. And which means blanket of rock. And unlike the sort of dirt that you think about on Earth, it's much more jagged and sharp. And so, you know, if you put it under a microscope, it looks like little glass and stone knives. So there's some concern that if you breathe it in, it's going to scar your lungs. And there's a disease on Earth called stone grinders disease that people get by, you know, Mm -hmm. breathing in tiny little pieces of stone, scars their lungs. We're a little worried that would be a problem on Mars. Additionally, on Mars, you get these dust storms that last for weeks and can engulf the entire planet which makes it very difficult to rely on things like solar power. So you're going to want to have maybe small nuclear power stations and people are working on sort of designing these nuclear power stations that you can take from Earth and bring with you to Mars and bury a little bit away from the habitat. But it's going to make solar panels tough. And then finally, it also has some poisons in it. 
And one of those poisons is perchlorate. So this is a chemical that binds to your thyroid and messes up the hormones your thyroid makes. And those control things like blood pressure and heart rate. And so, you know, this is presumably what you would be trying to plant your crops in. And we know that it gets picked up by crops and that it would be bad for you to consume. And a lot of advocates that we talked to said, well, you know, it's water soluble. So you just rinse it and then you're fine. But like my husband and I bought a farm that we do grow food on that we give to our children. And if somebody said, yeah, this farm has chemicals in it that could be really bad for your kids, but just like rinse it real good first. I like <laughs> we'd be like, no, it's cool. We're going to live somewhere else. And so <laughs> and and there's all of these problems that just sort of like build as you yeah. learn about living on Mars, you know, like there's toxins and you got to worry about that dust getting in the habitat and like you're going to be spending a lot of time dealing with all of these solutions for all of these tiny problems. And it's going to be a lot. I think it's doable, but it's not going to be luxurious initially, at least. Yeah. Hey, folks, I just want to take a break from our episode to ask you to consider becoming an LCI insider. We want everyone to feel engaged and excited about what LCI is doing. And the best way to do that is if you become a monthly supporter at $20 or more per month, you will become what we're calling our LCI Insiders. You get some free gifts. You get an exclusive Crisis King magnetic lapel pin. We give you two copies of Faith Seeking Freedom. We send monthly eBooks months ahead of when they're released on our public website. You can get discounts on our swag on our online store, and you get exclusive invites to our quarterly live streams with the LCI staff. In addition to that, whenever we do publish something like a physical book like Strangers with Candy, we'll also send you those as well. So the best way to stay up to date on what we're doing and to support what the Libertarian Christian Institute is doing, including supporting the podcast you're listening to right now, is to become an LCI insider. So to do that, go to libertarianchristians.com slash donate and then choose recurring monthly gift and you'll be added to our list automatically. Thank you for your support and I'll let you get back to the podcast. Did you come across any research that sort of wanted to integrate, like, I don't know what the technology is labeled, but imagine, like, the movie Avatar where, like, we're actually not on Mars, but we can live in these, like, haptic bodysuits where we can feel like we are. Is anybody advocating that, or is this literally we got to send human flesh to space? I think most of the people are specifically excited about sending human flesh to space. Yeah. Like, I I think the the joy is in actually physically being there. Yeah. Okay, so not the illusion of actually being there because then you don't know if you're being, if it's just simulation or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, honestly, it's like, I like, you know, like like flying a drone, you know, in the mountains and it's like, oh, well, look, I get to see this, you know, from like only a few hundred feet because, you know, in an airplane, you can only get so low unless you're mm-hmm. in general aviation. But like you get to fly a drone, and it's like, oh, this is really great. I would think, you know what? If I could launch a drone that I know is on Mars, and I guess how would I actually know this? From Earth and fly it and like get to explore Mars, you know, in a sort of VR experience. I don't know. I think I'd be pretty happy with that (laughs) because I know I'm never going to get there. But, you know, I think a lot of us would be happy with that. And, you know, I think the people who really want to settle there aren't going to feel satisfied by that. But I think that they might think of that as a good way to get the general public more excited about learning about Mars. And, you know, people like you and I would like that opportunity. But I think the people who actually want to live there would be very disappointed. Yeah. Okay. So, well, I want to tell you my one minor disappointment in your book. Okay. And you touch on it because I'm reading it and I was like, okay, are you going to talk about terraforming? Ah, And then uh you have like one paragraph. And I'm like, really? Like you couldn't have had an appendix later for me to enjoy your thoughts on terraforming? And I realize that you kind of explain like that's the far out view as opposed to like the settlement zone uh, Mm -hmm. or the settlement phase of getting there. So do you have thoughts and did you do research on terraforming? I'd, I'd just love to hear what you have to say about that. Sure. Terraforming is this idea that, you know, Mars has temperature that's not great. It's got this thin atmosphere. And so, you know, if you could, you know, for example, make that atmosphere a lot thicker in some way, Mm -hmm. then maybe you could get a bit of a greenhouse gas effect to warm things up. And if you could increase the pressure in the or increase the atmosphere that people maybe one day could walk outside without a spacesuit. And spacesuits are a pretty giant pain in the rear end because first you have to like breathe pure oxygen for a while because if you walk out in a spacesuit, then the nitrogen is going to bubble out of your blood and that causes problems. And so basically trying to make Mars much more like Earth. Mm -hmm. And there are some proposals. We didn't research this a ton because like you said, it's a very far off problem. And if you were to decide to terraform 
Mars first, you'd essentially be saying we're going to wait generations before we actually move people there. But so you know, there are proposals to, for example, drop nuclear weapons at the poles of Mars because there's a lot of water at the poles. And if you did that, you would spray the water vapor up into the atmosphere, which would trap some heat and you could sort of start warming Mars and making it a bit more Earth-like. You'd have to wait for a while for the nuclear you know, radiation to wear away. Mm-hmm. And additionally, there's some who argue that even that wouldn't work in the long term because the solar winds are going to slowly blow away the atmosphere that you've built because Mars just doesn't isn't able to hold on to it the way that Earth is. And I think that's pretty much the extent of the terraforming research that we did. Yeah, okay. We looked into it a little and it looked like even the proposals for it were not very good. And at the end of the day... International law, I think, would say absolutely not. Like, the international community is not going to let you send nuclear weapons to Mars and ruin <laughs> it for everybody. So it, we're not optimistic about the near-term yeah, okay, prospects. Yeah, okay, Well, it does seem to, I mean, if the international law piece aside, it does seem to fit into your wait-and-go-big approach. Because if we mm. can sort of dabble in controlled climate change for Mars, then we could make it there in, you know, 150 years, which is the wait-and-go-big approach, which we'll probably talk about. I want to get to a couple of the legal questions if we have the time, but let's talk a little bit about the whole reproduction thing because everybody who thinks about sex in space thinks about basically the act. And there's a whole lot more to it, as most teenagers don't yet know. There's a whole lot more (laughs) to what reproduction is like and what comes after that. You mentioned a little bit about growing up in space. So what were some of the things that you had to sort of research and come across? And and what were some of the, the technologies proposed that we might do to have childbirth on the moon or Mars. So we already talked a little bit about how radiation and partial gravity might cause problems, and those problems could extend to the way a fetus develops mm-hmm. or, you know... In zero gravity or in microgravity. Right, or, yeah, or partial gravity like on Mars. And additionally, you know, women are born with the eggs that they're going to have, and if they're walking around exposed to radiation in space their whole lives, but, you know, by the time they're 18, maybe they've had some damage to those eggs, which could mm. cause some problems down the line. And additionally, you know, so if you've got hips that are weaker than they are on Earth, then maybe you have to worry, and muscles that are weaker as well, maybe you have to worry about the ability to actually, you know, make it through labor. And so we did see some proposals for, like, centrifuges that would essentially, like, help the baby move downwards, or, like, if it's a problem to not be at Earth's gravity during your pregnancy, then you could go on like a banked racetrack that would simulate gravity. And like the good news is you wouldn't wonder if you're going to get morning sickness because you definitely would uh, going around (laughs) in these circles over and over and over again. And so there, there are some proposals. Most of them seem a bit extreme and not necessarily ideal. The rotating space station people argue that if we do have trouble with partial gravity, we are 100% going to need to live on these rotating space stations. So the idea is that you can rotate it fast enough that you can simulate Earth's gravity. So if our bodies need 1G, then these rotating state space stations can offer that for us. But it's really, they're going to be really hard to make. Not impossible. We don't have them yet. The International Space Station is the most expensive human-made project ever, and that houses six people and doesn't even rotate. And so the idea that we're going to be able to build a rotating space station for, you know, a million people, in my mind, that's a long way off. Yeah. But again, not impossible, but a long way off. So those are some of the technological solutions we came across. But we also came across a lot of people who essentially said, look, this is going to go, this is going to go wrong. We have to accept that we're going to have some problems and we're going to have to let natural selection take its course, which essentially means we're just going to have a bunch of dead babies. and that was really upsetting to me. Eh. And then there was another there was another camp of people who said, well, we're going to have to change what we think of as valuable human life because it's going to be so much work to live in these early space settlements. So much of your time is going to be spent on like subsistence farming and fixing the equipment that we won't be able to support people who have disabilities because we just are not going to have the time. This sort of gets us into the wait and go big approach. So my personal opinion is that if we are creating a backup for humanity, that doesn't bring with us some of the advancements that we've made in human rights, then that's sort of a disappointing backup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you wait and go big and you wait until you, you know, can bring enough people that you can specialize and you can have excess, you know, we know enough that you can have excess resources and excess equipment and excess time, 
then, you know, when one of us ends up disabled, we can still care for each other and value our lives the way we, you know, we hopefully do down here pretty well. So yeah, so that's part of the reason why we like this wait and go big approach. You can have more specialization and you can sort of, you've got a little bit more leeway if something goes wrong to, mm-hmm. uh, to continue taking care of each other. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the legal, the international law aspect, which I, I didn't realize weighed so heavily on this particular issue because... I think there is a lot of Western, in Western civilization, the founding of America, they came, they came to the Eastern part of the America, and then they just settled West because there was all that land. And we look up at the planets or the moon and, the, and Mars and well, for that matter, any moons of Jupiter or wherever we might want to go to. And we say, well, it's just all a bunch of land and you know, who, whoever gets there first and can mix labor with their resources and, and make something of it, well, that's mm-hmm. theirs. But there's about six square inches of viable land on the moon. So there's that problem, right? For the purposes of like an audience, like a libertarian audience, that's going to be the perspective or the sort of implicit method for looking into, hey, well, why don't we just settle space? It's got to be that easy or that straightforward with respect to rights claims on other planetary bodies. So why Mm -hmm. is it not that simple in your mind? Yeah, so let's see, where do I start? So... Around the 60s and the 70s, the USSR and the U.S. started setting off nuclear bombs in space, sort of as a way to show how awesome we are and as a way to sort of show that, like, if you depend on satellites for communication, we know how to knock those out. And this made the international community really scary, that these new nuclear weapons were now being set off in this new domain. And the world kind of got freaked out enough that they decided they were going to come to the table, including the Soviet Union and the U.S., and decide what are our rules for space? And this is where the 1967 Outer Space Treaty came from. And it's signed by the Soviet Union, now Russia, of course, and the U.S. I said, of course, but I understand the Soviet Union was a lot more countries than just Russia. But anyway, so it's very widely ratified. And essentially what it says is that in space, you cannot claim sovereignty anywhere. So you can't send people to the United States, according to international law, You can't send people from the United States to those six inches of good land on the moon and say, you know, this is now part of America. That would be violating a treaty through the United Nations that the United States has signed and ratified. And it is also the case that we've made Antarctica and the deep seabed commons as well. So those are also places where we decided, you know, now that we have nuclear weapons, what we're going to prioritize in these honestly kind of crappy places where we don't really know that there's a lot of economic value and it's going to be hard to live and that we don't even have the technology yet really to make a go there. We're going to call these places commons. And that has made economic gains from those locations close, maybe even exactly zero, but it has maintained peace. And so I guess that's the answer. Article two of the Outer Space Treaty says that you can't just go and claim sovereignty. So the open question, though, is Can you go, for example, to the moon and go to the few places where you can find water? And could you extract that and then sell it as rocket fuel for people who want to, you know, stop at the moon on the way to Mars, for example? And that is a question that the international community is grappling with right now. So the United States' interpretation is that that is different than sovereignty and that it's okay to go and extract resources and then sell them. They become yours at that point. And... The Obama administration signed a law to that effect. Trump had an executive order to that effect. This seems to be one of the few things our political parties can agree on. NASA recently came up with the Artemis Accords and a bunch of countries around, yeah, a bunch of countries around the world have signed on to this interpretation of the Outer Space Treaty. So not all countries have that interpretation, but that's the U.S.'s take on that question. Okay, okay. So there's plenty more to say on the legal aspect there, but we're running short on time here. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to say, have you come across any research since the book was sent to your publisher that you didn't get to sort of sneak in maybe in final, like last minute drafts or whatever? Anything come in that's been interesting, whether it affects your pro? I mean, I, I don't think there's any research that would say, oh yeah, your book is now obsolete, but what have you come across? I think the most interesting thing that happened while our book was in press was Starlink was used, is still being used very heavily in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Uh And uh, a bunch of people would say to us things like, you know, if Musk wants to go to Mars and he wants to break international law, start a new settlement, 
No one can stop him. And we used to say, well, Musk doesn't have a lot of geopolitical power. The U.S. could stop him by just saying we're not going to allow any more resupply ships to go to Mars. And so we're just going to not give you the FAA licenses that you need. But it actually turns out that Musk has way more geopolitical power than we would have guessed because he was at some point making decisions about where his Starlink uh, uh-huh. receivers could be used. So he, you know, the Ukrainian army would like make some gains, but they couldn't use Internet in those regions until Musk said, OK, that's good. You can use it. And so I think a lot of that detail has been worked yeah. out now, but Musk had a lot more geopolitical clout than we realized. Yeah. yeah. I think there was a little bit of, I, I've recently read his biography and it seemed to me that he kind of awakened to that realization because there were some things that Ukraine wanted to use as Starlink satellites to do that he was like, whoa, whoa, whoa that's not what I sent those over there for. Yeah. Because he doesn't want to have more conflict. No. And there was a United Nations meeting where the Russian delegate said, hey, you know, we're not going to say they, they didn't call Starlink out in particular, but they said, you know, satellites that are used in this, you know, quasi military yeah. fashion, you know, we have a right to shoot those satellites out of the sky and they do have the technology to do that. And I think that that got Musk a little worried about, you know, maybe kicking off World War Three and he became a little bit more careful from then yeah, on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. We think, oh, well, no one can stop him because, oh, what are they going to do? They're on Mars. Like, what can we do? It's like, well, these people aren't completely severed from Earth. He has assets in the U.S. So, like, in theory, if it really became dangerous, there's leverage on his assets in the U.S. And just to use Musk as the proverbial villain, which, you know, is probably not a deserved title for mo- most days of the week. But we have relations with one another on Earth. So what countries do outside of Earth still matters for the people on Earth. And that was sort of the realization I came to while reading your book. It's like, oh, okay, well, fine. What happens up there on the moon, maybe we can't really, quote unquote, control. But those people have interests on Earth still. They haven't seceded from Earthlings. Yeah, and, and they are still some country's responsibility, according to that Outer Space Treaty yeah. that we talked about. Yeah, they, you know, if Musk does something on Mars, it's the United States' responsibility to figure out a way to get him yeah. back in line. Yeah, yeah, okay. I have a couple of very short, fun questions to ask just out of like, as I'm reading your book, I'm like, oh, I want to know what she thinks of this. What's your favorite space travel or space settlement movie or TV series? Probably The Expanse. Okay, good. You're going you're gonna to please a lot of my listeners with that one. Okay. <laughs> um, what about the most accurate book, show, or movie? Oh. Uh, I know the answer most people who know give, but I want to know where you, where you are. I really, I, so to be honest, when I read sci-fi, I'm not reading it for like an accuracy check. I just, I accept whatever world they create. And as long as they're consistent with that world, I go with it. Okay. And so I don't usually think about. Well, what about your favorite? We go with that. A book. Let's go with favorite book. Favorite book about sci-fi. I really did like The Moon is a Harsh Mistress by Heinlein. Most Uh of mine are like more classic sci-fi books. So that might be my favorite. Okay. All right. What's yours? Mine is uh, James Michener's Space. I don't know if you've read that. No. I don't know his style a lot because I've only read that one book. But it starts off with the pilots in World War II and there's like different sections and then it goes to the Apollo race or whatever or the Apollo, the Gemini and the Apollo years, and it's fiction, but it gives you the sense of the trajectory of what, it was written in 1980. So whatever was going on in terms of like mankind's ambitions, it's just a fictional account slash narrative of what does it look like to end up on the moons of Jupiter, right? And you don't actually get there. It's not sci-fi in that regard. Mm -hmm. It's actually more historical in a way because it gives you a sense of the feel there's even like a character that I believe is sort of a Scientology proxy, like a guy who like swindles old women who are like waiting for aliens to come or whatever. Like I think he was, I don't know if it was Scientology, but like it was, you know, like hoaxes that mm-hmm. people fall for. And so there's all these interdynamics. So there's like four or five main characters. So that was really good. It wasn't really sci-fi, but it was about the idea of making it to space as humans, which would be there. And then I read Red Mars, Kim Stanley Robinson. Yeah. That's really hard sci-fi. I didn't realize how like detailed sci-fi that was. Did you get through the whole trilogy? I didn't. I have the second one on my shelf and I haven't gotten to it yet. It's just, you know, one of those things. I like that they did think through like how would you get a constitution that everybody could sign into yep, or, yep. you know, sign on to. So they did get a lot more of the like human side of things. And so it, it, it was a fun read. Yeah. Well, that was where I got the idea of like asking you about terraforming too, which is yeah. like that was their approach. 
And, mm-hmm. you know, part of the plot of the first book. So, well, everybody who's listening to this needs to buy Kelly and Zach Wiener-Smith's book, A City on Mars, Can We Settle Space? Should We Settle Space? And Have We Really Thought This Through? It's a fun read. It's educational. Like I said earlier, it's chock full of things that even if you don't quite care about settling in space and it's just kind of, you know, ambivalent about it, you're going to learn a lot of things, including economics and science and some other stuff. So, Kelly, I really appreciate you coming on and, and talking about this. Thanks. I really appreciate the invitation. This was fun. All right. Thanks. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you liked today's episode, we encourage you to rate us on Apple Podcasts to help expand our audience. If you want to reach out to us, email us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com. You can also reach us at LCI Official on Twitter. And of course, we are on Facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to find out more about LCI, visit us on the web at libertarianchristians.com. The voiceovers are by Matt Bellis and Catherine Williams. As of episode 115, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. Hello, everyone. It's Doug from the Libertarian Christian Podcast. You might notice already that this recording sounds quite a bit different from usual. In fact, it probably sounds pretty crappy. Well, I'm doing this to show you something pretty amazing. As you might know, the guys over at Podsworth Media have been producing my show for several years, quite a while, hundreds of episodes. And now they have a brand new online app for taking rough recordings like this one and making them sound a whole lot cleaner and a lot more listenable in just a few easy clicks. So here are some of the core features. They remove background noise. It reduces plosives, which is really handy for me because I often forget to put my pop filter on before I do a YouTube video. I often forget to put my pop filter on before I do a YouTube video because pop filters look terrible when you're on camera. It fixes clipping. It removes clicks and pops. It fixes clipping. It removes clicks and pops. It evenly levels dialogue so that you don't have somebody talking really quietly. And then somebody talking really loud because they're too close to the mic or too far away from the mic. It evenly levels dialogue so that you don't have somebody talking really quietly. And then somebody talking really loud because they're too close to the mic or too far away from the mic. How do you use it? It's easy. You go to podsworth.com, you click get started. And because you're a listener to one of the Libertarian Christian Institute's podcasts, you can get 50% off your first order by entering the promo code LCI50. That's LCI50 and you will get 50% off your first order. If you are doing anything like a podcast, a video, a sermon, an audiobook, anything that's spoken word, you want to use podsworth.com and clean up your audio to be even more professional and polished. You want to use podsworth.com and clean up your audio to be even more professional and polished.